Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. All right, well, we're back. We're back in the new year. Back to Bible study, back to all of our usual rhythms of life, I'm sure now, at this point, a couple weeks in. Um, and uh, I'm excited that we uh, get to dive back into the book of Hebrews tonight for our study. Before we do, um, I just want to go over a few announcements because we have like a ton of stuff going on as a church family right now. Um, this upcoming weekend, we have uh, the missions weekend um, that's hosted by our missions committee. And they're bringing in several missionaries. And I am really looking forward to this. I mean, I think it's just going to be so encouraging to hear from all these missionaries that we support. And so that'll be on Saturday night. Um, beginning, I think snacks begin at 6, and it starts at 6.30, and then on Sunday morning, um, we'll have several of the missionaries there, and that's, what, no, it's not here, it's at um, Storm Grove Middle School, yep, both events, Saturday night and Sunday morning, so um, I'm very excited for that, the week after that, we have uh, the Stand for Life on um, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, uh, so that will be a great Sunday as well. Uh, many of you, I know, have been to the new building. Uh, many of you have worked on it, uh, and things are progressing there. Um, you know, everyone's doing their part, and uh, we're, we're seeing progress, which is exciting. Um, and we're just going to continue uh, making progress until we can get in there. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, we have Sunday school starting soon, uh, taught by Jerry and Miko. He shared that on, on Sunday. He's going to be teaching the book of Daniel. That's going to be starting not this week, but next week. I got it wrong on Sunday. Um, so that's very exciting. He'll be teaching the 8.30 to 9.30 hour in the morning. And then uh, Muffy, his wife, is starting a new women's Bible study, which is awesome. And then also, we um, are going to be launching small groups soon. Uh, so we've been talking about it for a while. We are um, finding our leaders right now, and we uh, are going to do, be doing a training with those leaders, and then we're going to have signups, and we're trying to get things rolling soon. So um, lots that's happening as a church family. I'm sure there's lots that's happening in your families um, and in your lives right now as we kind of get into this new year. Uh, but tonight we get back into Hebrews, and it just feels right to begin the year with our focus on God's Word, and with all these things going on, we want to, again, take ourselves back to uh, our greatest priority, which is God, and knowing Him and loving Him through His Word. And so, um, I'm going to read our passage for tonight, I'm going to pray, we're going to get into it, but before I do that, um, I want to kind of, basically kind of catch you up on where, where we've been. Uh, so that if you've missed a couple weeks, or maybe you simply just don't remember because it's been so long since last year, uh, it feels like that to me, um, I just want to kind of catch you up. And if you haven't already turned in your Bible, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4. So you can go ahead and turn there. Hebrews chapter 4 is where we're going to be uh, this evening. So Hebrews is a book all about Jesus. <laughs> That's a simple version. Uh, it, it's, it's addressed to a group of Jews or a group of Hebrews who at this time were tempted to idolize and uh, to also go back to the Mosaic law or the, the law that was given under Moses. And uh, it wasn't just the actual law itself, but um, what the law instituted. So the, the priesthood and the sacrifices and all these things, all the systems and rules. And the author, to put it very simply, the author is trying to show us, trying to show them and us, that Jesus is better than all these things. Jesus is better um, uh, than all of the Mosaic law. He is the fulfillment of it all. That's the main thrust of the book as a whole. Well, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, the main idea is that Jesus is better than angels. And so he begins by talking about angels, these magnificent beings that the Bible says delivered the law to Moses. And so Jesus is seen to be the founder of the message of salvation, uh, to have 
a message that is even more reliable than the message that the angels gave. And he is the ultimate messenger because he is God himself speaking God's words and communicating who God is to us. So all of that is to show us that Jesus is greater than the angels, that he is uh, the radiance of the glory of God, that he reveals God to us in the fullest way, and he reveals God's plan of salvation in the fullest way. Well, then in chapter 3 and 4, the author shows us that Jesus is better than Moses. So he goes from these angelic beings who were the ones who delivered the law to Moses to actually the prophet and the first leader of the people of Israel, Moses, this great man. And we considered how Moses was this great leader. He was a faithful leader, but Moses was simply a servant among God's people. Jesus is a son over God's people. So uh, uh, Moses served the people of God, but Jesus had a far greater position being over the people of God. Uh, it said that Jesus has far more glory than Moses. And so today, we continue off of that, and what Scott taught the very last time, which I'm also going to review as we go on, uh, really, in response to this idea of Jesus being greater than Moses, he then takes us back in time to, is this a little loud? Am I talking a little loud? I can talk quieter. Got it. Let's do that next time. So, I can try to talk quieter too. So, um, he then takes us from talking about Moses and showing us Jesus is greater than Moses. He then takes us back in time to look at this moment in the history of the people of Israel where they are uh, wandering in the desert. They've just been um, delivered from slavery in Egypt. They're, they're in the desert. And he actually brings us to a psalm, Psalm 95. This is in chapter 3. And in Psalm 95, um, David is looking back at this time, and he's urging uh, the, the people of his time to not act as the Israelites did in the wilderness toward God when they hardened their hearts toward him. And it says at the end of that psalm, and this is this chapter 3 if you're following along, uh, that as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so we end the uh, end of chapter 3 with this idea that the people of Israel were not able to enter the rest that was promised to them because of their unbelief. And so now we head into chapter 4. Tonight we're going to cover uh, verses 1 through 13. And so I want to read uh, the whole passage for us first, and then um, let me pray, and we'll begin uh, talking about it. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says this. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterwards, and the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. 
So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's pray. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. Father God, we come before you tonight in this first Bible study of this new year, asking for your help through your spirit. Lord, first and foremost, to understand this passage of scripture, but not just to understand it, but to live our lives in light of it. Lord, we need your help as we begin a new year to live, uh, to speak, to think, to have relationship, uh, to love, to care for others, all for you and for your glory. We need you, Lord, and we need you in this time as we open up your word. We ask for the Spirit's help, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, the title for tonight's message is Striving to Rest. Striving to Rest. As we approach this passage, and as you might have heard as we were reading it, there's a very dominant note of the idea of rest. And so as we're thinking about this, a question that I have for you, not to actually answer, but are you tired? <laughs> are you weary? Do you feel worn? Because I know for me, this time of year is very exciting. It's a time when I think about the new year, think about my goals for the new year. It's a very reflective time, at least for me. But it's also a time when I feel particularly tired. Christmas is always busy. And we come through that season, and there's some rest there. Uh, but this season is always busy. But maybe that's not you. Maybe, maybe uh, this season you do feel particularly rested. But consider your recent years. Consider the last couple of years of your life. Have they been characterized by rest or restlessness? By rest or by weariness? I think that all humans struggle to rest well. Uh, some are better than others, but I think it's something that we all struggle to do. And part of that is I think uh, part of, of the sin that is within us is that we want to be God, meaning that we want to be limitless. We do not want to have to lay our heads on the pillow at the end of the day. We want to be able to keep going. And it doesn't just apply to sleep, but we want to be limitless in every way. We, we, we don't want to have the human limitations that we have, and so it makes rest in every sense of the word difficult. But I also think that there's something deeper to that, too, uh, to the fall of humanity that we see in a slightly different way at the beginning of the Bible. Uh, in the very beginning, God put Adam in the garden to work it. And so we know from the very beginning that when all things were good, God gave Adam the assignment to work. So we can see from that passage that work is not a bad thing. He gave it to Adam before there was ever sin in the world. But after man rebelled against God, it says in Genesis 3 that cursed is the ground because of you and in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So there's this sense of toil. By the sweat of your face, in pain, you shall eat all the days of your life. Cursed is the ground. 
And so all of a sudden, because of sin, we now have this effect on our lives where work is no longer something that, you know, uh, was simply this good thing in the beginning, but now there's this aspect of, this, of work, and work not even just in vocation, but also in our everyday lives. There's this aspect of work where there is a, a toil to it. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense of it that leaves us weary, a strain. Uh, the, the book of Ecclesiastes speaks to this as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, it says, What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? Then it says this, For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. And so we see again there this idea of the toil of work. That even at night, when his head's on the pillow, his heart's not at rest. And as I was studying this chapter and thinking about this idea of rest, I was attempting to define it and go through the passage, and we're actually going to do that in a second, and, th and think about what it means. But it occurred to me that rest is a word you can define, but it's also a word that we feel deeply. Like, if I say that you are going to have a time of rest soon, it's something that we feel deeply, right? There, there's, there's a feeling of like, oh, really? <laughs> like, I need that. Like, there's a sense of peace. Um, I, I think it's, it's something that, that we all need and that we all feel that need for. But with that, I do want to look at the passage. I do want to try to define from the passage, what is rest? Because that, that is a very central idea to this passage, is the idea of rest. It's a word repeated again and again. And so what is rest in the sense that we are talking about here? So let's, let's, let's do a little work here to figure out what is he talking about when he speaks of rest? Well, in general, when you kind of search for a definition of rest, uh, the general idea that I see across most definitions is to cease from work, to stop work. And we see that very simple idea in this passage in verse 4, uh, when it says, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And then in verse 10, it says, For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So the rest he's talking about for us is very similar to the rest that he's talking about that God had in resting from all of his works on the seventh day. And there we can see very, I mean, there's, there's a lot there, but we can also see the very simple idea that God ceased from creating. He stopped creating. He stopped his creative work in that moment. And so that's very simply what we can learn about rest, but there's more we can learn. Um, this word was originally pulled from Psalm 95, uh, that's what the quotations are that you see in your Bible. All of those are from Psalm 95. He quoted Psalm 95 two times in uh, chapter 3. Really, it's like he's preaching Psalm 95 right here in the book of Hebrews. He, he keeps referring to it, going back to it. Um, but in Psalm 95, again, we already talked about this. Psalm 95 is referencing the people of Israel in the wilderness before they entered the promised land. And we read this about that very time in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. It says, You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. So he's very clear to say we're not, <laughs> we're not going to do this, everyone acting about what is right in their own eyes. But then in verse 9, it says, For you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. He says, but when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your contribution that you present, all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Okay, the, the main idea that I want to pull from this passage of Scripture 
is that here we see that the idea of rest is actually the idea of a place. And we also see this in behind the Greek word in, in Hebrews for rest. Um, it doesn't just have the idea of rest, but the idea of a resting place. Uh, the idea of an abode, a, a, a place of rest. We see that same idea in Deuteronomy. The inheritance, the land that God was going to give the people was this place of rest. We also see, if you caught, uh, he says, rest from all your enemies so that you live in safety. So rest is, is this place of safety too. Okay, so we see a couple ideas here. But then when Joshua leads the people into the promised land, he says this. This is Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 through 45. He says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. And not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So here again, we see that the people made it into the land and it says they had rest. But hopefully you were somewhat paying attention when we were reading the scripture. If we look back at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, it's very clear that Joshua did not give them rest. So the question we must ask is, what's going on here? If Joshua in the Old Testament, the book, says they made it in the land, they had rest, but Hebrews, the author here, says Joshua did not give them rest, what is going on here? Well, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, For if Joshua had given their, them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. And so what the author is doing here is he's using the promised land that the Israelites were promised and then led into as a picture or a, a metaphor. Yes, it actually happened. It was actually history, but, but a picture or a metaphor of a greater rest, a heavenly rest, a spiritual rest. For Israel, it was very physical. For Christians, it is very spiritual. Uh, th this promise of rest that he's very clear is still open to everyone today. Not to go into the physical promised land, but to go into a heavenly country that we see later in the book of Hebrews, but we won't get there. So we're getting this picture uh, that, that um, there's, a, there's a ceasing from labor. Uh, there, there's a place of rest, an inheritance, a place of safety. But let me give you uh, two more aspects that I think are important here. This is from Exodus chapter 31, verse 17. I just want to add this in there to paint the picture more fully of rest. But uh, this is actually speaking of the institution of the Sabbath. And it says, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. I think that's so interesting. Like that it would use that language about God that he rested and was refreshed. And I can't even dive into all of what that means because I don't know, but <laughs> that God was refreshed. But one thing I can see is that if our rest is like the rest that God had when he rested from creation, then rest is not only ceasing from work, but it's also refreshing. Uh, there, there's a refreshing, there's a renewing uh, nature to rest, right? It's, it's, um, it, it paints this picture for us. And last thing that I want to that I want to say to kind of paint this picture. Again, we're not we're going to walk through the passage in a second, but I wanted to talk about rest more fully before because it is such a central idea to the passage. But the last thing that we see uh, here is in verse 9, when it says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This word in the original language is different here than the word for rest 
that was used in the verses above. This is specifically a Sabbath rest. This adds a new dimension to it because the Sabbath wasn't just a day of ceasing work, but it was also a day of worship. It was a day of communion with God and with his people. It's not just like I stop working and I twiddle my thumbs all day. No, it's, it's, it's a day of worship too. And a, a day of um, fellowship with God. And so all of this paints a picture truly of heaven. Right? Like this is the rest that us as Christians hope in, look forward to. This is, this is the rest that we have. It's this, it's this place of, of safety. It's our inheritance. The Bible uses that language a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's a place where we have deep fellowship and communion with God, where we worship him. It's a place of peace, refreshing, restoration. All of this paints this beautiful picture. And before we continue on, just to ask the question, like, as we talk about this, do you not recognize in yourself the longing for this kind of rest? Does your soul not need this kind of rest? Because I know mine does. <laughs> so the main point of this passage today that I want to give you, and then we're going to walk through it, and um, is that there is a Sabbath rest that is coming for God's people. But we must persevere to enter that rest. There is a Sabbath rest coming for the people of God, but we must persevere to enter that rest. Right? Like this is such a beautiful picture of this heavenly gift of rest in this passage that the author's painting and that we see throughout the Old Testament. God resting after creation, the idea of Sabbath, all of this painting, this beautiful picture of rest. But this passage is not really like this light and cheery and ethereal, like, let's just think about rest passage. No, this passage is serious. This passage has great warning. This passage has strong words. There, there's an urgency to this passage. And so I want to look at it together, but it's important to know, like, there is this beautiful promise of rest. But there's also this, this urgency that we must persevere to enter this rest. There's two commands that are given in this passage that can be applied to us today. And the first command is that you must fear things that would hinder, from, hinder you from entering God's rest. You must fear things that would hinder you from entering God's rest. We'll unpack that. Let's look at verse 1. Therefore, therefore, referring to chapter 3, referring to uh, uh, the Israelites who did not enter that promised land because of their disbelief, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, while it's still on the table, while there's still opportunity to enter his rest, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Now, this might seem strange to you at first because it did to me. All throughout the Bible, there are these commands, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. And so now we come to this uh, command that says, let us fear. What's going on here? Well, we do know in the Bible that there is a right and good and healthy fear of God. And I think that that's part of this here. But from the context and what we're talking about, I think what he's referring to is he wants us to fear things that would hinder us from entering God's rest. Uh, namely, if we look back at chapter 3, verse 12, it says, take care, brothers. And literally, take care is, is, is like, literally like, look at yourself, like examine yourself, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. 
uh, at the end, it says uh, in verse 19 of that chapter, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And so ultimately, the thing that will keep us from entering God's rest is unbelief. Uh, uh, things that will drive us toward unbelief. So really, namely, it's sin. And while we don't want to, we want to find a right balance, right? We don't want it to be in an unhealthy way. But I believe from this passage and others that there is a healthy fear that Christians should have of sin. Right? We don't just walk and go day by day in our lives just pretending that we don't have this old flesh nature, that we don't have these temptations. To ignore that, to have no, no sense of a healthy fear of that will lead us into trouble again and again. The Israelites are the case in point of why we should fear. They were in the wilderness. And they did not fear the consequences of their actions. They did not, they did not fear what the idolatry uh, that they would continue on would, would lead to. Really, when we boil it down, they didn't fear God. That's the heart of this. They didn't fear God. They heard the good news, verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They did not receive that news with faith, but with unbelief. Um, we might ask, like, well, how did they receive the good news? Did they have the good news of the gospel? That's a question that, that I thought first when I read this passage. Well, no, they didn't have the gospel in the same way, in the same fullness as we do of what Jesus has done. But the whole book of Exodus really is a picture of the gospel. God rescues and saves his people from the bondage and slavery of Egypt and delivers them and then gives them the law and then sends them and leads them to the promised land. Uh, just as, as we, kind of this picture of the saving work of God in our hearts to deliver us from the slavery of sin and then to guide us by his word and lead us into the heavenly promised land. It's, it's a picture of the whole, but, but they also had Good news in other senses, too. Genesis 3.15, there's this promise of the one who, uh, they just sinned. And God gives a promise that Eve will have a son, and that son will crush the head of Satan. Right from the start. So we have the good news right away. It says that, that though Satan will wound this son, though he will hurt him, though he will be a suffering son, he will crush the head of Satan. And so we have good news right from the start, but then we have good news in Genesis chapter 12 when uh, Abraham is promised that through his family, blessing will go to all nations. Uh, we have good news even in Exodus at the beginning when God says, I've heard your cries and I've come to deliver you. So they have good news. It's not, not the fullness of that good news, but it is uh, the good news that God um, will deliver them. And yet, even though they experienced the power of God saving them from Egypt, they met that good news with hard hearts and unbelief in the wilderness. I think that sometimes when I think about Israel, and maybe you felt this too, there's, there's a really easy way that we can subtly think that we are just better than them that we would not have done all the things that they did, that we would not have made the mistakes that they did. But we're not. We're the same. They are an example to us. They're to be an example to us in our walk with the Lord of things to do and things not to do. And they fell in the wilderness, and that should give us a healthy fear of the Lord. And so, we must fear um, things that would lead us away from the Lord. Back in chapter 3, uh, in verse 13, 
and I'm referring back to this because it's really all connected. But it says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And I thought a lot about that, that phrase, the deceitfulness of sin. This idea that sin lies to us, right? That sin creates a deceitfulness both in us, but it also has a, an empty promise. Uh, the promise of sin is that it's worth it, that whatever that sin is will make us happy, whether it's uh, lust or gossip or pride or anger, giving into that sin will give us what we want, right? But the reality is that obedience is hard at first for a moment, but the benefits are long-lasting. Sin is easy at first, satisfying at first, but then quickly fades and the consequences are lasting. The shame is lasting. But sin lies. It says, give into this and you will be happy. Give into this and it will satisfy what you are looking for. But it lies, it's empty. And sin continues to lie to us until our hearts become harder and harder and harder to God. That's what happened to the Israelites. They gave into this sin of idolatry started worshiping other gods and their hearts got harder and harder and harder until they wanted to go back to Egypt instead of the land that God was giving them. And so we, we, we must guard our hearts. Uh, we have to be on guard. We have to have this healthy fear where we're asking others to help us see the sins that we can't see in ourselves, that, that we would look at those things and then we'd humble ourselves and confess and repent. So a question like, do you have a, a healthy and a right fear of sin? Like, are you on guard against it? The phrase I heard years ago, I can't remember who said it. But it, the phrase is that we must kill sin. Uh, let me say it this way. You must kill sin or it will kill you. And I think that's very true. And the Israelites are an example. So, we must fear. And the reason we have to fear is that we haven't yet entered into the rest. So let's continue in verse 3. For we have believed, enter the rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter in my rest. Okay, so we talked about this. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. So interesting here, he's he's. He's talking about the timing of this rest because we were referring to it as the rest that the Israelites would get going into the promised land. And he says, really, this rest started at the very foundation of the world when God rested from creation and it continues on to today. Verse 5, and again in this passage, he says, they shall not enter my rest. But here in verse 6, we see it says, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, that rest, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterwards, and the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Scott talked about this last time, but there's an urgency here. Today is the day to turn to the Lord. Today is the day to find rest in him. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not the next week. We are not promised tomorrow. We're not promised this evening. We don't know when the promise will no longer stand to enter his rest. We need to feel the urgency of that. Verse 1, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. Verse 6, Again, he appoints a certain day today. In the last chapter, again, it said, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Every day as long as it is called today. We must have an urgency. We must have an urgency. And I think that's what the author is connecting us here with this idea of, of like this healthy fear is that the rest has not fully come. Maybe we, we've experienced it in Christ in a way. We have. 
but the rest has not fully come. And so while we are still on this earth, we need to have this right and healthy food. All right, so that is the first thing that we see here. But let's go to the second thing. The second main command that we get in this passage is that we must strive to have faith-filled hearts before the Lord so that we enter that rest. This is the paradox of this passage. We must strive for the rest. Such an interesting way to phrase this, to strive, meaning to labor, to be diligent in, to endeavor. Really, the main thrust, I think, of this passage is that Christianity is not a walk in the park. That it's hard. That it's, it, 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 we, we've got to work at it. We've got to strive after God. We, we've got to strive to have hearts that are obedient to him in faith. And we've got to be on guard against sin and its deceitfulness. We've got to be clear about this and what the gospel says. Our striving could and will never justify us before God. We have to be clear about that. That only God's mercy and grace can give us a right standing before him. But the proper, we could say inevitable, response to that grace is to work to please him. We could say it this way. Legalism is working to have a right relationship with God. The big term that's the opposite of legalism is antinomianism. That would say that because God's grace is the one who gives us the right relationship with him, it doesn't matter what we do after that. That's also wrong. Biblical Christianity, it says this, that, that simple faith in God's grace is what gives us a right standing before him. But if that faith does not produce works, that faith is dead. That the works follow. Uh, it, that the person probably never understood or received that grace if they thought grace meant I get this and then I do whatever I want. They probably never understood it. We could say it this way. Um, we don't strive to be saved. Rather, because we are saved, we strive. That's the balance here. So strive to enter that promised rest. As we begin this new year, like how are you uh, working, laboring toward your relationship with God? Uh, how are you investing your time and energy to know him? How are you pursuing him? How are you uh, pursuing the rest that is found in him? Because we need to consider this because, again, sin is deceitful. The Israelites are our example. We have to watch our hearts and strive for hearts that are not filled with unbelief, but that are faith-filled, that are devoted, that are obedient to God. Why? Why must we strive in this way? Well, verses 11 through 13 tell us, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience that the Israelites did. Yes, but then we get this statement in verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This passage is very powerful. God's word is alive. It is effective. It is powerful. It's like a sword that cuts deeply into our hearts. Double-edged. The, the, the root word of that, that word sharper, it's, it's, it's this idea of not like hacking away at something, but like a, a single incision. It, 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 the, the, the sword penetrates our hearts. It penetrates us into things. Some people believe different things about this. This is what I believe. It, it penetrates, it pierces things 
and divides them that are indivisible. Soul and spirit, indivisible, and yet it divides them. Joints and marrow, it divides them. I think the idea is that like, these things are so closely woven together, and yet the word pierces us so sharply that it divides them, and it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This passage is really getting to our hearts. It's getting to our hearts. Like, are we striving for hearts that are filled with faith and devotion to God? Or are we having our hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? That's what the Israelites did. They were hardened. And he's pointing us to something better. He then says that no one is hidden from God's sight. Everyone's naked, exposed. The word there for exposed has this sense of like the, the neck being exposed. Like it's, it's, it's extremely vulnerable. To the eyes of him to whom we must give account, we must all give account. There's a weight to this. When you read that, like, there's a weight to it. When I think about the thoughts and intentions of my heart, I don't like to read that they're known by the Lord. I don't like to read that they're not hidden. I don't like to read that they're exposed. That every crevice of my heart, the Lord knows. Not only that, he uses his word to, to dig those things up in me. But here's the point. No one's hearts are hidden before the Lord. God reveals the state of our heart. There's no hiding from God. There's no running. There's no getting around giving an account to him. And so we must strive to enter that rest. That's what he's getting at here. We must strive to have hearts that are full of faith, not hearts that are full of unbelief. As we kind of conclude here, I hope that this message and this chapter of Scripture gives us an urgency about our faith, a, a priority of our faith. Jesus says that we are to take up our cross daily. The, the Christian life is not easy, but it is worth it. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And we have a glorious rest that's coming, right? We have that hope. We have that inheritance. We have that Sabbath rest that awaits us. This dwelling place in heaven, this place that is safe and peaceful, this place that is refreshing, this place that is about communion and worship of God. But as I was reflecting on this passage, it made me think back to the main argument of this whole section. Like, what, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? Well, 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 to take us back, we're really talking about, to start about how Jesus is greater than Moses. And when he begins to talk about these Israelites, he's very clear to point out, chapter 3, verse 16, who were those who heard and rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? Now, he doesn't speak poorly of Moses. He actually says early on in chapter 3 that Moses is faithful. But Moses wasn't enough. Moses was not the, 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 the leader who could give them that rest ultimately. But Jesus is greater, and he is the one who does give us that rest ultimately. This whole passage points us to the fact that when our faith and our trust is in Jesus, we can have a confidence that he will not fail in leading us home. He will be the one who leads us into that promised land. He will be the one who leads us into that rest. That's our confidence, that our rest is in Christ. And so, while there should be urgency to this passage, while there should be a healthy fear here, while there should be a striving, we cannot remember that we can have, or we need to remember that we can have confidence 
and our hope in Christ. He refers again and again to our confidence throughout this book. Uh, uh, rather than just saying our faith or rather than just saying what we believe is true, he says our confidence. We have confidence in it because it is in Christ. Matthew chapter 11, I love this verse. Jesus' words, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. True rest is given to us by Christ. And he says, come all who are weary. All who are weary. You know, I began by asking who's tired, who's weary, who's worn out. Probably thinking mostly in the physical sense. But there's a sense in which our souls get weary. In a deeper spiritual sense. And the invitation from Christ is that all who labor, all who are heavy laden, all who are weary, can come to him and find rest for their souls. We talked about the Sabbath in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul's instructing them about people who are judging them about certain things in regards to the Jews, like questions of what they should eat or drink, questions about certain festivals that they might celebrate. Um, New moon is another thing that he mentions. But he also mentions a Sabbath, uh, that there, there might be certain things that they're regulating about the Sabbath that they ought not to be. But then he says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. He's saying that Christ is our Sabbath rest. Ultimately, Christ is our Sabbath rest, that true rest is found in him. And when our eyes are on him, we can have a healthy fear of sin and unbelief and the things that might lead us astray. We can strive for the right heart before God. But we can also have a confidence that he, as the true and better Moses, will lead us home. And then, the words of verses 12 and 13, again, I think, are not as terrifying, but they can be encouraging. Yes, they're still serious. The word of God does pierce to our hearts and expose us. But we become thankful for it, even though it's hard. We become thankful that God's word shows us the sin in us because then we can confess, we can find grace in Christ, and we can keep moving forward trying to follow him and obey him. In fact, it made me uh, uh, reminded of Psalm chapter 19, which is what I want to end with. Beautiful passage about God's word. And I'm going to read the first part of it, even though I want to talk about the end. But it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Here is how we are to think of God's word. In all those ways, right, pure, perfect, sure, it revives our soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. And then it says, How are we to think of God's word? More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb, more valuable than what is most valuable, gold, and sweeter, uh, more filled with joy and, and, and pleasure than even honey. Moreover, by them, and here's what I want to point out. More, moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So here, he uh, uh, transitions from this beautiful array of describing God's word in all these ways. Then he says, by God's word, your servant's warned. Who can discern his errors? 
Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. What he's saying is, Lord, let your word discern my errors. Let your word search me. Let your word keep me from the presumptuous sins that I might not even realize that I'm doing. Here, I think, is the right heart that we need to have behind the word of God living and active, piercing to our hearts. Yes, there is a weight and a heaviness to that, but also we need to come with the, this idea of the psalmist that, that, Lord, discern what's in me. Help me see it. Help me know it. And then to end with this beautiful prayer in Psalm 19, 14. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So all of this so that our hearts, our words, our thoughts, what we meditate on and what we say might be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. That's the heart that we want to have. That's the heart that we want to, we want to end this with, right? And that's the prayer that we want to end this with. And so, let us fear. Let us strive. Let us have confidence in Christ. And let us again come back to the word to search us, to know us, and to guide us into meditation of heart, words of mouth that are acceptable before the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your words would impress themselves upon our hearts this evening. That there are many reasons we enjoy this time. We enjoy it for snacks and fellowship and many different things. But ultimately, we come to learn from you, come to hear from you. Lord, this passage challenges me, challenges us to have a, a striving, to, to have a, a pursuing after you and after hearts filled with faith. And so, Lord, we ask for that. Pray that we would be a church that's not characterized like the Israelites were, where we have hard hearts. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that's characterized by hearts filled with faith. Hearts that want to pursue you. Hearts that long for that rest, that future heavenly rest that we can experience now in Christ but that we also long for and wait for and strive to enter one day. Lord, we need your help. We need your spirit. And so we ask that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.